Hi, welcome to uh, my uh, course on how to uh, take Section 107 uh, for drone operating. Here in uh, February 2023, I just uh, passed earlier this month uh, with 92% and uh, wanted to share with you a little bit about uh, what I did, uh, how I studied, how I approached the thing, what my experience was, the questions that I remember, and then also the questions that uh, I missed. So uh, we'll get into it. Um, these are scenes from my first flight. I uh, have a uh, Mini uh, Pro 3, really happy with it. Uh, it was great to get started once I had the paper in my hand. Uh, so I scored a 92%. I missed uh, five questions, if my math is correct. I would guess I studied about 10 hours and uh, probably thought about it for another at least five hours and, and reflected on it. The uh, questions that I missed, one of them was about uh, remote ID, uh, the uh, messaging elements, how that's sent out. And I'm not quite sure what the specific wording is, but uh, make sure that you understand the remote ID regulations and also how that operates. I missed a question on a Class D airport that was closed due to repairs, what that airspace reverted to. Um, so be familiar with those rules. The properties of a low temperature inversion when uh, uh, I think I had unstable air and it should have been stable air. So just understand how inversions work. There weren't many questions about temperature and uh, in weather, but uh, uh, they're good to get those points. Uh, there were two questions about the stability of the aircraft when the center of gravity moves aft, whether you lose control, whether you lose airspeed. Um, I know I missed one of them, Take a look at that, understand how uh, additional weight affects the performance of your aircraft. And finally, there was one on the types of airports that I missed and how operations uh, take place at the airport and what your rules are. It makes sense. I mean, the FAA is the one conducting this test. So what do they care the most about? Well, they care about how you interact with existing air traffic. So um, expect to probably be weighted a little bit more than in the past on topics related strictly to operating around other aircraft. So two tips right off the bat that I would recommend. Go ahead and get the test supplement book. This is the one that you're gonna be using during the test that uh, you might as well be familiar with it. If you know the charts, if you do practice test along the way, it's a lot easier to be able to refer to the actual book and you might even get a head start on some of the questions. Uh, the METAR uh, questions, the weather questions are all gonna be coming from that information. So that's real helpful. Um, don't bother with the uh, FAA guide. Um, I got uh, that document. It's poorly written, lots of typos, and there's not much there, and it wasn't current. Um, if you're gonna get another study guide, there's a lot better choices out there. Um, I would say, you know, even though it's only 70%, um, you probably couldn't just walk in and pass, um, even though that it's multiple choice with only three choices. So you assume that you get a 33% uh, without doing any studying whatsoever. But I don't think you could just walk in and pass. Uh, I think you would almost have to have some study. But I don't think you need a, a paid course. There is a lot of content on YouTube and a lot of really good stuff. Um, I would uh, definitely go to Katya's Buzz. Um, hers is both recent and comprehensive. Um, I also liked uh, the other ones on here. The Pilot Institute, of course, is the official provider. Um, Northcut is, uh, is really good. You want a couple of videos that'll give you the broad vision, and then you want a couple that uh, have fresh expiration dates uh, because there's the night vision that, or night flights that are on there. There's uh, operations over people. Um, you need to be current on those. And then also there's a lot of practice tests available, including the ones once you register on the FAA site uh, that you can get an idea of how, how you're gonna fare. So a couple of things that uh, were good tips for me. Um, at first I was gonna bring in a magnifying glass to uh, look at the sectional charts, but really just using reading glasses uh, that I picked up at the dollar store for $1.25 uh, worked fine for uh, separating those, uh, those airspace charts and uh, being able to use those. So that was fine. Also, it was fine to bring in coffee, uh, which I was a little bit concerned about. Uh, they did look inside of the mug to make sure that uh, I hadn't uh, smuggled any notes in. 
Um, a couple of other things. You can go through, you have two hours to take the test. It's only 60 multiple guess questions. So go through the thing twice. Um, there were actually quite a few uh, questions that when I looked through them a second time, I changed my answer. Usually they say first guess is best. But in this case, I would have to say that, no, nope, I changed, changed my answer. Some of the questions are trickily worded. Some of them are a little unclear. Some of the answers, a couple of them might be good answers. And trying to parse out which one is the best, that's really good. Also use your, uh, your bookmarks uh, feature on the app uh, that they use. Also uh, use scratch paper and just write down the answers as you go to say, okay, I'm getting close to my 42 required uh, correct answers. Um, so the subject distribution, uh, from what I've seen, it's going to be on FAA regulations and legal uh, regulations, uh, one fourth of it. Um, questions about airspace, uh, which airspace is which, all that is going to be another uh, one fourth or up to a fourth. Weather, not so much, um, but it's points. Loading and performance, that was where I missed things, and probably I would, I knew that, uh, you know, the aft center of gravity affects uh, airspeed and, and control some, but uh, the loading questions, that would have been helpful. And then finally, operations around airports. That's the bulk of it and where I really recommend you uh, find resources that'll help you with that. So um, some of the questions from memory. If you have an automatic flight mode, uh, what safety is needed? Um, the ability to override any time. Uh, what would be best to incorporate in risk management and alternative landing site? What is the process for analyzing risk and managing emergencies? Well, of course, aeronautical decision making. Um, this is all really basic stuff uh, that you might be able to get on your own. Uh, what's an antidote for impulsivity? Think first, act, late, act later. Um, on all of these, make sure you do know those hazardous attitudes and their uh, antidotes. Uh, there were probably three or four questions that if you answer remote pilot in charge, you're going to do all right. Um, some of the other ones I remember, you know, the uh, one from the table where a 35 pound drone executes a 45 degree turn. Uh, what's the load factor? You look at the chart. Um, there was one about a uh, V-15 uh, airspace. And what's the lowest allowable altitude? That one threw me. I'm not sure what that meant uh, even now. If uh, your registered drone is destroyed, what action do you take? Uh, well, you need to uh, deregister on drone zone. Uh, that was one that I was kind of guessing at. Uh, what's considered the ceiling? Um, I didn't remember the definition, whether that was the lowest lo uh, part of the cloud, whether it was the highest part of the cloud. Um, check that and know what the ceiling is. If a Class D airport is closed for the day, uh, what are the consequences? Um, it will revert to an E or G, um, depending on the location. Uh, the aftmost center of gravity would have what consequence on performance? Um, turning has what effect on performance? Uh, the lower stall speed, the signal degrades, uh, the reverts to straight and level were the three choices. So other ones I remember, identify the airspace in which the low tower top is located. Uh, there were multiple questions that were along those lines. Um, your visual observer has had drinks. What is the effect on flight? Uh, well, you can't do it. Um, and any of these questions where the FAA ask about uh, controlled substances, about uh, impairment, you always go, of course, with the most conservative approach. Um, what is the impact of amphetamines on performance? Again, it's degraded. Um, you're not more alert. Uh, don't, don't get cute on any of those. Uh, what activity can be expected around such and such an airport? Uh, when you look in the chart, you see the little uh, parachutes. Um, so be familiar, familiar either with the symbols or with the table of contents in the uh, legend that's at the front of your test book. All of the answers uh, for those symbols is in the text. text of the test book, the uh, legend. Uh, the maximum weight of a small drone is under 55 pounds. This is one that I was glad that right before I took the test, I'd gotten a clarification. It's not 55 pounds, it's under 55 pounds. 
and then also the minimum age of a drone operator, uh, what that is. So some of the other ones I remember. For night operations, what is the required strobe blink rate? So uh, both of these could have been correct. Uh, as often as is safe or two times per second. Um, I guessed correctly, which is as often as is safe, um, but two times per second wouldn't have been bad. Um, what is the universal frequency as a default? Um, that one, just knowing from memory, uh, got me a point. Uh, what is denoted by the magenta circle with the C in it? Um, anybody who studied for five minutes should know that CTAF. If you're operating in an airport, what action do you need to take regarding the tower? Um, that uh, is one that gave me some pause. I forget what the choices were. Um, but again, it's one where there were a couple correct answers, um, but one is going to be more correct than the others. Um, when flying over people in class two airspace or as a class two operator, what is required? And the answer was the document of compliance. Again, look for videos and resources that will get you into um, operations over people, what the definitions of those classes are. Um, that's going to be something that uh, you'll want to have. And I think probably as time goes on, more questions are going to be regarding those. Um, also, as uh, we get closer to the remote ID implementation, I would expect that the test is going to transition to some more of those. Um, wind shear can occur when? Of course, that's any time, any altitude on any flight. Uh, what conditions can be expected as temperature and dew point converge? Um, that was uh, fog, um, but uh, you know, that, was, that was one where knowing your weather was helpful. Uh, looking at the TAF forecast, uh, what was the temperature period or what was the time period covered by the forecast? Um, so being able to read your TAF and your METARS uh, charts. What is the minimum visibility required at a particular airport? Uh, that was a little bit tricky. It's always going to be three miles. Um, doesn't matter what airport. Uh, to operate a, uh, a drone, you need to have three statute miles visibility. If you use a bright light to operate the drone uh, before night flight, what is the best response? Uh, 30 minutes, uh, of course, to let your eyes adjust is the right answer. Again, make sure that you've gone through the uh, night operations uh, materials. Um, what One question that threw me is what type of pilots are covered by Section 107? Civil, civil and public, or recreational? And so um, I said civil, um, and I believe that was the correct answer. But the other ones, I, that, that's when I came to a couple times and uh, was, was thinking and unthinking and rethinking. Um, but, uh, but that's one to look out for. In an emergency, can you break away from a Section 107 rules? And of course you can. Um, and, uh, if the FAA uh, request information about that, you provide it uh, is an answer that might be uh, to a question you get. Near a building, you experience poor performance. What might be the cause? Um, it was uh, signal interference coming from the building's Wi-Fi systems uh, was the answer. Uh, when do you activate remote ID? Um, there was a question about the process, um, and it's basically when you turn on the, uh, the drone and the controller, and then you don't turn it off until after you've landed. Um, remote ID is pretty well from out of the box to back in the box. Uh, what is required to be broadcast by remote ID? And I think this is my question, whether it was the controller location, the GPS coordinates of the controller, um, uh, the serial number of the aircraft, um, so understand remote ID um, and how that works and what are the components of it. Um, at the test center itself, so those are the ones I remember. Um, and uh, I would say that's a good, good selection of them. Um, they allowed you to uh, stash your, your cell phone and wallet and stuff. You didn't have to leave it in the car. Um, they had a drawer that they could put things in. Uh, nothing is allowed. They provide you with the pencils, the scrap paper, the test book. Um, and the test room that I was in, they had cameras on uh, myself and the other participant. Um, they didn't come in. You could leave to use the restroom, uh, but you needed to check in with the front desk 
uh, proctor to let them know, of course, the timer keeps going. You're still on your two hour clock. Um, when you log in on the computer, uh, you take a couple practice questions. Uh, where, what is the capital of the United States? That sort of thing. And then uh, you launch the exam. Uh, you hit submit to turn in the test. And then there's some customer survey questions after that. Um, you can't just jump up and say, wahoo. Um, there's a few other things. Uh, the scores will be at the front desk, uh, plus instructions on how to apply uh, for your uh, certificate. Um, they will not give you the actual ant questions that you missed, which makes sense. They don't want those going out into the wild too much. Um, but they will tell you what sections of the regulations uh, apply to the areas that you missed. So uh, that was helpful to, uh, to help try to nail down what I, I got wrong. Um, in a week uh, to 10 days, I think it was right at uh, 10 days, uh, you'll get your temporary certificate. Um, and then it's about two months uh, for you to get the actual card. I haven't gotten mine yet. Uh, on February 19th, when I checked the FAA site, they said they were processing December uh, 19th uh, applications at that point. Um, so. One of the things that happened uh, was, you know, when the proctor stashed our, uh, air, our cell phones, uh, they asked if we had turned our ringtones off. Of course, they don't want to be sitting in the office and hearing that. And I asked to leave mine on. I said, well, my ringtone is actually in Class B airspace. The ceiling extends to 10,000 feet, um, which I thought was a pretty good joke, but uh, uh, it wasn't actually true. Um, so I hope this is helpful for you. Um, the, Section 107 is not an easy test, um, but it's, it's certainly doable with a little bit of, uh, of time and, and effort. Um, one of the things, if uh, I was so excited about getting up and, and operating the drone and, and you know following the rules, I put together this checklist. So if, uh, if it's helpful, uh, go ahead and download it. It'll be in the comments and uh, kind of covers the things that, uh, that you'd want to do before a flight and also helps you keep your logbooks. And, uh, and so if somebody asks you for them, uh, you can be compliant. Um, and uh, here's uh, a little shot from uh, my first time out uh, after getting the certification. And uh, yeah, that's the DJI Mini Pro 3. Um, really uh, uh, beautiful. This is outside of uh, St. Louis. It's February, so we don't have uh, much in the way of foliage. Uh, but it still gives you a hint of uh, things to come. So I hope this has been helpful, and I hope that uh, you do well on the test, and uh, look forward to maybe seeing you uh, out in the field uh, with a controller looking up at the sky. You have a good one, and thanks for listening.